Good, uh, good morning, Real World Crypto. I'm excited to be here, uh, kicking off the final day of what's always my, my favorite event of the year. So I'm going to be talking about the, the noise protocol framework. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Trevor Perrin. I do um, consulting on applied cryptography and protocol design, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on in the last few years in this area. It's called the noise protocol framework. It's a, a framework that helps you in creating secure channel protocols uh, by secure channel protocols, I mean things like TLS or SSH and IPsec, two-party protocols where both parties are online at the same time and they want to authenticate each other and agree on some shared secret keys for encrypting their communication. So this is a simple but important class of, of protocols. These are the workhorses of practical cryptography. Most of the time when encryption is being used on the internet or probably anywhere, it's within the context of some secure channel protocol. There's other types of protocols, of course. There's cryptocurrency or, or secure messaging, where you might have multiple parties, more than two communicating, some of them offline at the same time. Those are more complicated things, so we're going to be... Um, the noise framework sort of restricts itself to just looking at this relatively simple case of uh, two-party online secure channel protocols. That's what I'm going to be, be focusing on today. Um, and you might be asking, uh, actually, why would we do this? Because we have secure channel protocols, we have TLS, we have SSH, we have IPsec. They were a lot of effort to build over, over many, many years. You might ask, why would we want to start down this road again and start building new, new protocols from scratch? You might also ask, what is a, a protocol framework? Even if we wanted to build new protocols, why would we, be, uh, why would we need a new framework for doing that? And let me just kind of tackle those questions off the bat. I think we're going to, I think we're not done with secure channel protocols. We haven't reached like a final state of perfection. We're going to continue wanting to put more crypto, new features, uh, new forms of resilience against more advanced attacks, new sorts of optimizations for specialized use cases around smaller footprints, um, earlier encryption, less compute time. So I think we're going to continue wanting to put more and more features and optimizations and capabilities into our toolbox of, of secure channel protocols. But at the same time, what a lot of people want in specific cases is more simplicity. And so there's a, a real tension that kind of arises here if you're trying to build a single general protocol in, that provides all these things. Because you know, the more features and capabilities we step into a protocol, the less simple it becomes. And as it becomes less simple, it becomes more dangerous. Because if you're carrying around um, features and options in navigation, uh, negotiation for things you're not using, uh, there's just a lot more risk that an attacker could negotiate through all that, find some bug, uh, you know, that's a security bug. So trying to combine, uh, deal with this tension is hard if we're just building one protocol because we're going to build a protocol, we're going to put in a bunch of features, it's going to be not enough for a lot of use cases, but it's going to be too many for many other use cases. And so that's the tension we're going to try to sort of resolved by thinking about protocol frameworks. And the idea behind a, a framework for, for a protocol is that you have a small set of, of layers and elements. They combine in a very structured and easy to understand way to give you a large space of potential protocols that a, a systems designer can choose from to give them something very specific. So we're trying to manage this tension by giving you a large space of sort of possibilities you choose at design time, but uh, the capability of very, very simple specialized implementations. And so that means interacting with a protocol framework like this is going to be very different from dealing with kind of a single packaged, full-featured protocol like TLS, where you can just point two libraries to get, uh, at each other and they'll probably figure out how to communicate. They'll do fallbacks and negotiations and retries and figure out the subset of features they support. And you know that's an impressive feat of engineering. If you're a web browser and you need to support the last 10 years of, of web servers on the internet, you, you might need to do things like that. But there's a lot of use cases for secure channel protocols that are not web browsers and would probably be better served, uh, in my opinion, by having you know, maybe more specialized protocols that do kind of exactly what you want, nothing more than that, even if that requires some more uh, effort up front at design time to think about what you want and understand what exactly you're getting out of this framework. So that's the, the sort of framework goal of, of this noise thing. But that's not really the goal we started with. The goal that we started with in building this framework was actually to do something kind of different, which was to explore the idea of just building protocols out of using a single public key primitive, out of using the Diffie-Hellman function, um, in my opinion, the best public key primitive. 
And the, uh, you know, the reason we want to do this is because it's just a little different from the mainstream secure channel AKA protocols, which mostly use Diffie-Hellman just for key agreement and use signatures for authentication. But in the last uh, several years, there's been some growing attention to just trying to build everything more minimally out of Diffie-Hellman itself, and it, it kind of looks a little bit like this. You could look at a, a conventional kind of mainstream authenticated key agreement, and an AKE protocol just is like the core of most secure channel protocols. It's the part that agrees on the key and does the authentication. So a traditional AKE protocol, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of like Sigma or kind of like TLS 1.3, just has the party send uh, a Diffie-Hellman ephemeral public key back and forth. Um, Bob will authenticate himself by sending a signature over everything previous that's encrypted. Alice will authenticate herself the same way. The signature key is kind of agreeing to the shared secret key by signing everything, and the shared secret key is kind of agreeing with the signature key by encrypting its signatures, and so everything agrees with everything else. This is a good protocol. Um, it's a good way of doing things, but we could do things differently. We could, instead of sending signatures, send max, calculated in the same way over the transcript, but where the MAC key is taken by these Diffie-Hellman uh, outputs that serve to authenticate the parties. And so, you know, I'm writing here uh, kind of a weird notation to describe these different Diffie-Hellman outputs that are going to end up in our protocol. I'm saying the EE output is going to be like the ephemeral to ephemeral DH. The ES and SE are going to be ephemeral static DHs. Let me try to make that notation a little bit more clear because I think it's going to be helpful for a lot of things I do later on. If we imagine that there's Alice and Bob, they each have a, a static and an ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key pair, then we could imagine there's four possible DH operations they can do, and we can label them just by reading left to right from Alice to Bob. So there's a, uh, an ephemeral to ephemeral DH they could do that uh, you know, is going to give them forward secrecy because they can throw away the ephemeral private keys after the DH, and then you can't uh, compromise their static keys and get that EE key back again. The uh, ephemeral static DHs are going to serve for authentication because if Alice chooses an ephemeral, does a DH with Bob static, she's going to know that Bob's the only other person who could calculate that key. If Bob uses that key in any way to produce a Mac or something like that, Alice knows that she's talking to Bob. So this is going to be our notation to describe different DH operations in this context. So if we go back to this, we can kind of see what's going on a little bit better. This MAC1 is using Bob's uh, ES uh, DH that authenticates him. Alice's MAC2 is using the SE DH that authenticates her. So we have a sort of like DH-based version of uh, a Sigma-like protocol. And there's some nice things to doing things, to kind of translating protocols into this style. Uh, without signatures, we have less code. We don't have to implement signatures. We have smaller messages. We don't have to send signatures. Um, if we want to do zero round trip encryption, it becomes very easy because the parties have static Diffie-Hellman keys, which you can just encrypt directly to in kind of an ECIES style without having to um, do pre-shared keys and resumption and tickets and all of, all of that, which you would have to do if the parties only had, had signature keys. And these sort of protocols will probably have better deniability than doing signature-based protocols because you're not signing things in a way that's third-party verifiable. So this, this sort of protocol is, the style of protocol is, is well known. You know, the, the Kudla-Patterson paper is where I, I sort of first ran into it. But there's Naxos, the Naxos paper, uh, Ian Goldberg's NTOR, Hugo Krauchik's OptLS proposal for TLS. Uh, and these things have made their way into practice. There's, uh, again, NTOR used by uh, TOR for its circuit handshake. There's a number of DH-based protocols by Dan Bernstein and, and team, like SALT, CurveCP, DNS Curve. And these are all really elegant designs, but you know, when I was looking at them uh, a few years ago, it struck me that every time someone builds a protocol in this style, they sort of have to, to start from scratch. And they, they design their own transcript hashing and key derivation and message format. And if they're doing security proofs, they'll specify a unique security model and do their own GAPDH ROM proof. It's similar to everyone else's GAPDH ROM proof, but still a lot of work. So the idea, the kind of gave rise to noise was to try to create a framework and a set of elements so you could build protocols in this style without repeating all this work and just by moving the Diffie-Hellmans around get a, a wide range of protocols. So I started trying to, to work on that in 2013 or 2014. I talked to Mike Hamburg uh, around that time and took some ideas that would later, of his ideas that would later give rise to the Strobe protocol framework of sort of 
viewing symmetric cryptography as kind of a sequence of sponge-like accumulation steps, I think that lends itself well to this style of protocol, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that in a second. But with that idea, we were able to, I think, come up with a really nice language and framework for, for building a range of protocols like this. And, um, you know, in the last few years, we've kind of built a small community around that, that framework. We've got a mailing list, websites, specifications, uh, a bunch of open source libraries for common uh, languages, and we've got even some users. So WhatsApp has deployed a noise-based protocol for client-server uh, communication since first quarter of 2016. The WireGuard uh, uh, Next Generation VPN Tunnel by Jason Donnefeld is a very nice uh, piece of uh, VPN software and protocol that's, that's getting a lot of attention recently. And we're getting interest from a few other directions, things like low and embedded Internet of Things systems, back-end kind of data center systems for efficient um, encryption between computers you control, and some more far afield things like cryptocurrency. Uh, the Lightning Network proposal for Bitcoin incorporates a noise-based protocol, and a number of anonymity network proposals are investigating noise-based protocols. So kind of where we've got to at this point, we have a, a sort of stable core protocol and then a bunch of extensions we're considering, but we at least do have kind of a, a part of it that's been pretty stable and constant since 2015 that we've got a fair amount of, a, of a, a certain amount of adoption for. So that's a little bit about the, the history of the project and some of the goals of wanting to build a framework for DH-based protocols. Uh, now we're just going to kind of dive into it and um, look at what goes into a secure channel protocol and try to break all those elements out into a set of, of recombinable components that we can put together in ways to create a, a lot of different protocols. So the components of a, of a secure channel protocol are, you know, there's kind of two main phases. There's a handshake phase where you send a few messages back and forth to authenticate and do key agreement. There's a transport phase where you use the agreed upon key just to send encrypted traffic. Uh, using an agreed, uh, a shared secure key to send encrypted traffic is fairly easy, so we're not gonna say much more about it. We're really gonna focus on what happens during the handshake. And what happens during the handshake is primarily this authenticated key exchange. So a, a protocol similar to this type of protocol I showed you before, where you send two or three messages back and forth, you do some authentication, you get some shared secret key, that's the heart of all these protocols. But there may also be some negotiation. The parties might have to uh, agree on the parameters that are going to go into all these subsequent phases. And so that could mean deciding the exact AKE algorithm, deciding what types of keys to use, deciding what type of cipher to use for the transport phase, and so on. So you can think of negotiation happening sort of logically prior to everything else and determining the parameters of everything else, though in practice to um, optimize round trips, negotiation is often sort of um, interwoven with the AKE. So the first message the client sends might be an initial kind of speculative AKE message combined with some negotiation data that says, I'm trying to do this, but I'm willing to do other things. Tell me if you'd like to do something different. So there's a, a kind of combination of these, these protocol flows in, in practical AKE, uh, secure channel protocols. So if we want to take this, this set of concepts and break it down into elements, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to separate out the negotiation from everything that happens after that. And the reason why is because negotiation is the, the worst thing that happens in these types of protocols because it involves making decisions based on talking to other people. And that's a, a very risky thing to do. In a crypto protocol, we have to talk to people because we're a protocol, but we don't have to necessarily make decisions based on that um, unless we're doing negotiation. Uh, making decisions is dangerous. It involves parsing things that people give you, and parsers have bugs. It involves creating a state machine and having logic around what people give you, and that's a source of bugs. Um, it involves conditional branching and processors, which is super dangerous these days. So there's a lot of reasons we, we don't want to make decisions at all in our important critical crypto code. So what we're going to do is we're going to say everything after negotiation is going to be sort of just decision-free, and we'll call it a, a noise protocol and have this notion of a linear noise protocol that just executes one AKE, does transport phase encryption, and it's just one packaged thing with a state machine that looks like this. It's a good state machine because it, it doesn't do anything. It just advances. Um, we can't quite get exactly that simple because bad things might happen and we're going to have to abort the protocol when a Mac fails or something like that. But this is kind of where we want to get to in our crypto, in our crypto design, in our implementations. This is easy to test. It's easy to think about, and so on. 
So, and we get there by separating out negotiation and saying, okay, let's have a single point where decision gets made. It's going to be, uh, we're going to only allow the, the server to make like one decision. And this, the, the decision is going to be, I could um, accept the client's initial noise protocol or I could switch to a different noise protocol. So we're going to try to condense everything down to one decision so we can just really try to limit the damage of decision making in general and just allow it to be uh, transitioning from one thing to another. And that will allow us to express common protocol patterns such as the client saying, I support two ciphers represented by two noise protocols and the server can choose one, which one to use. The client could say, I'm trying to do zero round trip encryption to you based on what I think is your current key. If you're not able to decrypt this message, the server will say, okay, let's switch to a different thing. Um, let's switch to a, a slower handshake. So we can express zero round trip or basic negotiation things. This is a very restricted form of negotiation, but these are, this is a simple class of protocol. That's mostly all we, we need to do, to do secure channels. Um, so once we've kind of pushed negotiation off the side, we're going to just focus the rest of our effort. And really, this is what the, the noise project has mostly focused its effort on, is just designing these noise protocols, these linear, straight line, um, very simple protocols that could be used by themselves or with a, a bit of negotiation. And so if we take this linear notion of a noise protocol, we're going to break it down into further elements by separating out the, the kind of abstract notion of what a, a handshake is, a handshake pattern uh, is what we'll call that. And then we can kind of separate that from the crypto we plug into it. So we can plug, you know, public key crypto into it, symmetric crypto into this abstract handshake pattern to get a, a concrete noise protocol. As a, as a user of this framework, you'll interact with this just by naming it. So you, there's names for handshake patterns, there's names for crypto algorithms. You concatenate these names together and the spec tells you uh, how to kind of compile that into a concrete noise protocol. And it's, it's Mostly, you know, some parts of this are pretty easy to understand, like you're plugging in a DH, you're plugging in the cipher you use for encryption. But there's a couple parts I'm going to just expand on a little bit more. And one of those is how we use the hash function to provide complicated features such as uh, transcript hashing and key derivation. The other thing is, is the patterns. So the hash function is going to be used to construct kind of like this stateful, sponge-like, strobe-like object that we're then just going to feed all of our inputs into and ask it to encrypt things. And this is just going to kind of take care of all of the, the transcript hashing and key derivation that can be a complicated part of these protocols if you try to be really fussy about it and only hash the exact things you need and so on and hash the exact nonces or sign the exact nonces you need. But if you take kind of just an expansive view, like is probably the modern trend in protocols and just kind of hash everything together and just encrypt everything based on everything previous that's happened, then it actually becomes kind of easy just to do all your symmetric crypto and hashing and we can sort of ignore that and then just think about the, the kind of patterns that we want to build on top of that. And so the, the patterns are, that we're going to express is in a, a simple language based, again, just on this uh, ability to, uh, we're going to have a language that expresses protocols that can only do two things. It can send public keys and can do Diffie-Hellman operations. And now we can just build a bunch of protocols on top of the symmetric crypto stuff kind of like this. Uh, I'm going to just run through a, a few examples. Uh, a pattern like this describes public key encryption, or ECIES encryption. We use this stuff before the three dots to indicate knowledge Alice has, knowledge either party has, before the protocol run starts, and then we describe the protocol. So Alice knows Bob's public key, she sends an ephemeral key, she does ephemeral static, sort of chem-dem style uh, DH, and then has a key that she uses for transport phase encryption of stuff. This is encryption. If we want to add authentication onto this, we just throw in a static static DH. So now Alice is authenticating herself to Bob in a single message. Um, if she needs to tell Bob who she is, she can send her public key. And this is just going to be get encrypted because it's fed through this symmetric uh, crypto object thing, which already has this encryption key in it. Um, if we move to interactive protocols, we can, this is an unauthenticated Diffie-Hellman we express like this. We add server authentication um, by just having the server send its static public key. If the client knows the server set a public key, it doesn't have to send it. And in that case, we could even do something fancier. We could do zero round trip encryption in the first flow by just moving the ESDH to there. Um, we could also do zero round trip authentication in the first flow, uh, you know, again, by just throwing in an SS. Um, but in, in the case that, that the server static might have been compromised, you'd want to refresh that with a fresh authentication. So add an SE in the next flow. This is very similar to the WireGuard pattern, except WireGuard adds an additional a uh, pre-shared symmetric key that can give you some post-quantum resistance if you manage to share that pre-shared key in some other way. 
So this shows how you can kind of just build up a bunch of complicated things by moving simple elements around, and we can kind of extend this to different types of crypto, like pre-shared keys. We could even go back and, and translate this back into doing signature-based AKEs or, or add, try to add post-quantum chems into here. So I think we have a framework that is hopefully extensible. Um, ends up looking kind of like this, and I'd love to get other people showing up to help us kind of build it out, extend it, um, help prove things about it, and implement it or find use cases for it. So thank you for listening, and I don't know, but I'd love to take questions if I have time for it. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for questions. I, <coughs> I have not, not so many, I mean, I have questions for you too, but uh, I want to make some comments. Uh, first of all, I think it is a great work. Uh, this modularity is something that uh, is very welcome and very well thought. On the other hand, uh, one has to be careful about uh, random combinations, not, not all combinations are equally secure. So, uh, but, but, but overall, I think the modularity is great. Um, in particular, I want to, pro I mean, I, I want to uh, support this type of uh, protocols that are based only on Diffie-Hellman. They have uh, many, many advantages. Uh, they are simpler than those that combine signatures. They don't require just another primitive of signatures. They are great for post-quantum because you can build them with chem them without post-quantum signatures at all. Um, one main reason we, I think we don't have that as a TLS 1.3 is that we don't have uh, certificates for uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, keys. And, you know, I would like to see more movement towards uh, having these certificates because then we will have these, uh, these better protocols. And finally, uh, some self-promotion. <laughs> uh, th this, this protocol, uh, Ike version one, has a public key uh, mode of operation, which is exactly this. Uh, I mean, this protocol called Scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's exactly that. So it's more than 10, 15 years. Oh, it's, yeah. it's more like 10 plus 15 years. <laughs> so anyway, um, good work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Thank you, yeah, and those are a bunch of good points, um, in particular that there are certainly ways we could combine those tokens and move them around that would be bad ways. So the way we kind of deliver this to users with, with named sets of patterns, and the patterns have to meet certain validity rules, but there is some care that needs to be taken there. Um, yeah, and certainly this is, is similar to Scheme. Scheme was kind of framed more around a public key encryption than just DH, but um, I think you're definitely right that this is like a lineage of things that goes way back to like Protocol 4 by Blake Wilson and other people. So this is a, a style of protocol that's been around for a long time. Super cool work, thank you. Um, I heard about this cool ratcheting idea that someone came up with. Um, have you considered putting a sort of post-compromise forward future secrecy ideas into noise protocols where you overlay Diffie-Hellman values in there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we haven't looked at that too much for this. It does have we've kind of specified an ability to do like a symmetric key rekey thing where you just kind of replace your symmetric key with some of its own output so you can just kind of roll forward and get some very lightweight forward secrecy. I mean, I think these protocols tend to assume that you're online at the same time. So if you needed to renegotiate and wanted to kind of refresh your forward secrecy, you could just do another handshake, which is what something like WireGuard does is just handshake every few minutes. So, um, you know, we haven't thought about really trying to like merge all that stuff together. I think it's kind of nice that these are simple and just address the online case. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.